Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. All right, everybody, I want to welcome you to part two of the special Forerunner Chronicles series, The New Age Agenda. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we learned that in the book of Revelation, there are many codes and symbols. We are told this in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, starting at verse 1, which tells us, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to give unto his servant John. That word signified in the original Greek from which the book of Revelation was translated means that the book of Revelation was placed into codes and symbols. So that dragon and that woman in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 are symbolic of other things. But what are they symbolic of? The Bible always gives us the answers. In the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 we are told in reference to the dragon and the great dragon that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon primarily is a symbol of the devil. Now let's deal with this woman. What is this symbolic of? Well, the Bible gives us an answer in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6 and verse 2. We are told there, I have likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. So the daughter of Zion is a comely and delicate woman. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51 and verse 16, the Bible goes on to tell us at the very end of that scripture, and say unto Zion, thou art my people. So Zion is the people of God, and God has likened the daughter of Zion or his people unto a comely and delicate woman. So a woman in Bible prophecy can be a symbol of God's people, God's church. So in Revelation chapter 12 and 17, what we are seeing here is the devil moving with great anger in warfare against God's people, his church. Why? Because they keep the commandments of God and they have within their possession the testimony of Jesus Christ. And one of the methods by which the devil is carrying out this insidious warfare against the people of God in these last days is found within the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible tells us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, and this simply means that the Spirit of God is being very outspoken, that in these last days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed or paying attention to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. It is by the means of these satanic agencies putting their deception out into the world that many people will depart from the faith, meaning that they will give up their belief in the word of God and consequently their relationship with Jesus Christ. And this whole attack is not just isolated to the people of God, neither is it isolated to one particular country. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, starting at verse 13, 
And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out the mouth of the dragon, and out the mouth of the beast, and out the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Notice that they are attacking the kings of the earth as well. This is men that have political power, men that have financial power, men that have control over the media, men that have influence over the masses so they can use the influence to redirect the masses that we will pay homage to the devil and not give our service to the true and living God. The devil wants us to unite with him in fighting against God in the battle of Armageddon. But let's take some time to analyze something that we didn't analyze in part one of this series, and that is these unclean spirits that are like frogs. Why do you think that the Bible uses frogs to identify these unclean spirits? Why not snakes? Why not cockroaches? None of us like those. Why do you think the Bible uses frogs? Well, one thing we can do is look out into nature and see some very peculiar characteristics about frogs. Number one, frogs use their tongues to catch their prey. Notice that these frogs are coming out the mouth of these three different entities, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. This means that by means of their false teachings, they will ensnare their prey, which happens to be you and I. But by the grace of God, we will never fall to these deceptions. But they want to trap us with their fear, deceptive speech. Number two, have you ever heard a frog croaking before and you went to try and locate it? And then you quickly realized that you couldn't tell exactly from which direction the croaking of the frog was coming from? This lets you know that the frog's croaking or its speech is very elusive. You think it's coming from one direction, but it's really coming from the other. In other words, they may come out speaking in good words. They may come out with their humanitarian purposes. It may seem like peaceful agenda. It may seem like good things, but the underlying purpose, which we cannot perceive, is actually to bring about our destruction by making us fall to Satan's deception. That is two reasons why frogs are used here in Revelation 16 and verse 13. But now let's see what the Bible has to say about frogs in the book of Exodus chapter 8. In Exodus chapter 8, we are given a portion of the historical account in which Moses and his brother Aaron journey within the borders of the land of Egypt to carry out their mission which God gave unto them. This mission was to go before Pharaoh and to command him to let God's people go so that they could worship the true and living God according to the way that he commanded that they should worship him. And to let Pharaoh know that he was serious about his commandment being carried out, God worked many miracles which were plagues by the hand of Moses and Aaron. One of these plagues is found within the book of Exodus chapter 8 and verse 6. We are told there, and Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt. And frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Then in verse 7, we are told, And the magicians did so also with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Now let's take one second to quickly analyze what took place here. By the power of God, Aaron had the ability to bring forth frogs upon the land of Egypt. This was to plague Pharaoh and all of the inhabitants of Egypt so that they would know it's time to obey God's commandment. However, Pharaoh's magicians, which were the high priests of the Egyptian occult mysteries, a belief system, a religion in which men communicated with demonic spirits and came under the deception that they had the power to be like God, these men, by the means of these demonic agencies, had the ability to also bring forth frogs upon the land of Egypt. And the primary reason that they worked out this black magic was to strengthen Pharaoh 
and all of the inhabitants of Egypt in their rejection of God, in their persecution of God's people, and in their rebellion against God's commandment. And for all of you out there that are familiar with this biblical account, you know that the frogs were the very last plague that the magicians were able to counterfeit. This is the main reason why frogs are used as a symbol of the three unclean spirits in Revelation 16 and verse 13. What we are looking at here in Revelation 16 and 13 is Satan's last great deception to strengthen the world in their rejection of God, in their fighting against God's people, and in their rebellion against God's commandments. Satan is gathering people for the battle of Armageddon. In other words, Satan is trying to initiate people into his ranks so that they will fight with him against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you shouldn't be shocked at anything that I'm sharing with you here. Because the Bible clearly tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In other words, the things that happened in the past, they are now taking place in our present day society. And those things that will transpire in the future have already taken place in the past. Therefore, God requires of all of us to have an accurate knowledge of historical accounts, especially those historical accounts that have impacted his people, so that we can better understand the things that are happening in our present day society and so that we can make some accurate projections about those things that will happen in the near future. And the same way that Satan used occult practices and spiritualism to strengthen men in rejecting God and rebelling against God's commandments and in fighting against God's people in times past like we saw in ancient Egypt, he is using these same things in our present day society. And as you are going to find out in a moment, the New Age movement is behind these activities. We are living in the midst of a supernatural warfare. And through the medium of the New Age movement, Satan with his cunning sophistry has re-engineered the occult worship practices of ancient times and brought them into our modern day society. One of the main agents of this New Age movement was a woman by the name of Alice A. Bailey. Alice A. Bailey was the founder of the occult organization known as Lucis Trust. The original name of this organization was Lucifer's Publishing Company. The headquarters of this spiritualist organization is found within the United Nations, where it operates as a non-governmental organization. In the volumes of Alice Bailey's writings on the occult, she spoke much of the nations of our world developing a new world order, and the importance of an organization known as the Freemasons for the success of this endeavor. In one of Alice A. Bailey's letters concerning her thoughts on Freemasonry, she wrote, the Masonic movement will meet the need of those who can and should wield power. It is the custodian of the law. It is the home of the mysteries and seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity and the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its works. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples and under the all-seeing eye the work can go forward. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. Benjamin Krem, a man that is noted as the John the Baptist of the New Age movement, in his book The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, had these statements to make about Freemasonry. Through the Masonic tradition and certain esoteric groups, 
will come the process of initiation. In this coming age, millions of people will take the first and second initiation through these transformed and purified institutions. The new religions will manifest, for instance, through organizations like Freemasonry. In Freemasonry is embedded the core of the secret heart of the occult mysteries, wrapped up in number, metaphor, and symbol. When these are purified, these will be seen to be a true occult heritage. Through the orders of Masonry, the initiatory path will be trodden, and initiation will be taken. Now there's a few points that I want to highlight for you from those statements that were made by Alice A. Bailey and Benjamin Krem so that you pay particular attention to this information. Point number one, Alice A. Bailey states that Freemasonry is a far more occult organization than can be realized. Point number two, she also stated that Freemasonry is the custodian of the occult mysteries, which simply means they are the guardians of that satanic belief system. Point number three, she stated that the symbols which are protected by the Freemasons, they have embedded within them the ritual of deity. This means that those symbols that you find within Freemasonry, they all have connected to them the satanic belief system that man has the ability to be like God. This is the very same deception which the devil promoted at the first in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis chapter 3. And then point number four. Benjamin Krem stated that millions of people, millions of us, will be initiated into the occult when they can purify and transform their occult symbols, numbers, and metaphors. Now, if I was you, ladies and gentlemen, I would be asking how do they propose to purify and transform these occult symbols, numbers, and metaphors? Because it is by this means that they are seeking to initiate millions of people in our day into the occult. This means they are trying to make millions of us knowledgeable of the way that they think. They are trying to indoctrinate us into their belief system. And they propose to do this by purifying and transforming their symbols, metaphors, and numbers. And according to their writings, this whole process of purifying and transforming these symbols, numbers, and metaphors is done through what they call externalization. What externalization simply is, is to take an idea that is abstract, a concept that is hard to be understood, and to break it down, make it simple, and also make it attractive, so that people will not only understand it, but they'll desire to have it. And that's what they're doing to us right now. It's like a mother feeding her child vegetables. They're mixing their belief system with something sweet and they're making it slide right down our throats and we're asking for more of it. And by what means do you think that they are externalizing this belief system, this satanic belief system to the world? Well, in Alice A. Bailey's writings, she developed 10 stratagem by which the nations of our world could establish a new world order in which Lucifer would be acknowledged as sovereign. Two of those strategies were Strategy number eight, use mass media to influence mass opinion. Create mass opinion that is receptive to these values by using television, film, the press, etc. Strategy number nine, debase arts in all its forms. Corrupt music, painting, poetry, and every expression of the heart. Make it obscene, immoral, and occultic. Debase the arts in every way possible. Ladies and gentlemen, they are using mass media to shape mass opinion. They are using media, music, movies, video games, art, 
everything that they can get their hands on, the fashion industry, as a vehicle to promote to us their satanic belief system and we're not even realizing what they're doing because they've broken it down, they simplified it, and they've made it attractive to us. And if you're still not understanding how this whole concept of using the media for this purpose works, here's an example. As you sit down in the comfort of your own home, watching the television, and a program comes on in which one of these occult symbols can be found, subliminally the human mind will record this symbol in the subconscious and associate it with whatever message was being conveyed by the program at that time. In this case the message is, money is security. Then turning the channel on your television, another program comes up with the same occult symbol, but this time the message being conveyed is, disobey God. This message as well will be associated associated in your mind with that same symbol and then changing the channel once again you view another program in which the same occult symbol can be found but this time the message being conveyed is have sex this message as well will be subliminally associated to or connected with that symbol in your mind so consequently whenever you see that occult symbol your subconscious will influence your conscious mind to think have sex, disobey God, money is security, because the symbol that has been anchored in your mind now acts as a trigger to activate the subliminal messages that your mind has associated it with. And this massive assault against humanity to invade our conscious thought patterns via our subconscious for the purpose of molding our characters is a design that is being carried out by men, but it has been orchestrated and it is being supervised by Satan himself. For Satan is simply conveying his thoughts and his desires to the minds of his agents, which in turn use their power, their money, and their influence to push the devil's agenda. And all of this is for the purpose of leading millions of men and women, young and old, to either directly or indirectly pay homage to or give worship to the devil. My friend, I hope that your eyes are beginning to open and that you're perceiving what is going on right now. We are under the attack of this most subtle and seductive method of indoctrinating us with the doctrines of devils. And this whole conditioning process is for the purpose of accomplishing the design that is spoken of in the book of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. And that is to gather us to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. In other words, Satan is trying to initiate us into the ranks of his army so that we will be prepared in heart and mind to fight against God in the battle of Armageddon. And the most disturbing thing about this whole scenario is that the devil has stolen this method of educating from Jesus himself. Now you might be sitting on the edge of your seat and saying, what in the world is this man talking about? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. You see, when Jesus Christ walked upon the face of this earth, he spoke many parables. One of these parables were the sower and the seed. The sower was a symbol of the person that spread the word of God, the same way that a sower spread seed. And the seed, obviously, was a symbol of the word of God or the gospel of the kingdom. Why do you think Jesus would use a sower and a seed as symbols to present these most important principles of salvation. The reason why Jesus used these symbols was because they were common sights for those people that he was educating. And he knew that they would see these things frequently. It was his desire that as they saw sowers sowing seed over and over and over again, they would remember the principles of righteousness that he taught them and that one day these principles would transform their lives as they were recalled to their minds over and over and over again. And so Satan has taken this method that Jesus used 
to teach principles of righteousness, and he is using this method now to teach us the doctrines of devils. Has it ever once puzzled you as to why all of a sudden these very curious symbols have become popular in our secular society, like skulls and crossbones and eyes within pyramids? You can find them on business logos, on coffee mugs, on t-shirts, on baseball caps, on children's clothing, on undergarments. They are everywhere in our video games, in our favorite sitcoms, in cartoons, they are everywhere. And that is why now more than ever, we must separate ourselves from the things of this world. We must give up our worldly entertainment. We must give up our worldly fashions. We must give up our worldly music and give ourselves wholly to the service of God. For the Bible says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father. They are of the world. 1 John 2 and verse 16. And that is why the Bible counsels us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 17 and 18. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean things, saith the Lord God. And I will receive you unto myself, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord of hosts. If we want to be children of God, if we want God to be our father, we must separate ourselves from these worldly things which the devil is trying to use to contaminate us. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We are living in an age in which we need to purify our minds, our thoughts, and our desires, and the devil is trying to contaminate them, but if we separate ourselves from the things of this world, we can become pure so that we can meet Jesus face to face. For as the devil is purifying and transforming his demonic system of worship to be understandable and to be acceptable by humanity, we need to purify our minds so that we can be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God is looking for you to give yourself wholly and completely to his service so that he can use your life to magnify his beautiful and amazing character in this world. And the only way we can do this is if we are not conformed to the principles of the devil of this world. I want to encourage you. It is time to give up the worldly music, the worldly videos, the worldly video games, the worldly dressing. It is time to separate yourselves from the things of this world and to unite yourself to Jesus Christ. He loves you so much that he wouldn't want to spend eternity without you. This is the forerunner. And as always, whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth.